Do you enjoy our podcasts? Help us to be able to continue creating quality content by visiting our merch store at store.another12.org. You'll find some great merch there, and the best part about it is that a portion of every purchase goes to support the work that we do. Welcome to Drippings from the Honeycomb, the official podcast of Another 12 Ministries. We are so glad that you have decided to join us as we enjoy the sweetness of God's Word, one verse at a time. Hello and welcome to episode one of our journey through the book of Genesis. I don't think there is any book of the Bible that gives me more anticipation and more trepidation to walk through than the book of Genesis. Now, I know this might be a statement that sounds more in line with a study through the book of Revelation, and I understand that because Revelation is mysterious and it's difficult and it seems really hard to understand all the interesting references and the strange writing style. But the difference that I find when studying Genesis is that Genesis is the foundation for the entire Christian faith. Genesis is the basis of why man needed a savior to begin with. It's the historical record of where man came from, how man came into existence. It details all of our beginnings, and it details the beginning of the history of human life. And so approaching the book of Genesis is something that gives me a lot of pause. I want to make sure that I am getting things right. I want to make sure that I'm giving you the correct outlook on this book. So before we start actually digging into the text of Genesis, I thought it was really important to lay out some foundational basics about the book of Genesis. First of all, let me give you the outlook of this podcast on Genesis. This podcast is not designed to give deep apologetic arguments to skeptics. It's not designed to thwart enemies of the gospel. It's not designed to silence those who believe that science can answer everything. That's not the purpose of this podcast at all. The purpose of this podcast is to enhance the faith of those who believe in Jesus, those who are asking questions about the Christian faith, and those who are looking at the scripture and wondering, how does this fit into my life? What do I need to do in light of what the scripture says? Does the scripture demand a response from me? And what should I do with the call to follow Jesus that is lived out by the church and found in the word of God? My argument here is not so much that I'm trying to convince people who hate God that the book of Genesis is true. I am endeavoring to show that it is impossible to claim to believe in Jesus and reject the Old Testament, specifically Genesis. In other words, it's a package deal. You can't accept Jesus, say, I believe in Jesus, say, I trust in Jesus for my salvation, and at the same time say, I don't believe the book of Genesis. I don't believe that God created the heavens and the earth. I don't believe that God created man. I think Genesis is just a bunch of fables, a bunch of moral stories. I don't believe that any of this is real. And the fact of the matter is, as we're going to show in the coming weeks and months, that is not a valid position. That's not a position that Jesus accepted. It's not a position that the church has accepted in the past, and it's not a position that we should accept today or in the future. The bottom line is that Genesis begins the salvation story. Genesis is where it all starts. Without Genesis, there is no Adam. Without Genesis, there is no Jesus. Without Genesis, there is no salvation. The book of Genesis tells us how it all began, and the work of Jesus Christ finishes it on the cross. And the return of Jesus Christ will close the entire book and start the new book that will be eternity with him on the new earth. And so as believers, we are not free to pick and choose what part of scripture we want to believe. All of it is inspired. All of it is breathed out by God. All of it is divine. All of it is authoritative. And if we claim to be a follower of Jesus, we cannot pick and choose what we want from the scriptures. We must accept all of it. So with that in mind, let's jump in really briefly and take a look at the foundation of what we're going to discuss throughout this season of the podcast. Now, I could have gone into much deeper depth than I'm going to go to in this episode, but the reality is 
you probably don't want to listen to a two and a half hour podcast episode. So I'm going to give you some very basic foundational scriptures, some very basic foundational principles. And my hope is that you will be inspired to go and study this. My hope is that you will start to look into some of the amazing work that has been done by godly men like Arthur Pink or Dr. John Morris or Ken Ham or some of the other great researchers who have undertaken the book of Genesis and really looked deep into it and have written beautiful works that show that Genesis is true and accurate. They have done deep research and you can benefit by looking into some of these works that have been done by godly men and women who have studied this topic in depth. But for the purposes of our podcast here, we're going to start with just a few things. First, we're going to start with the pillars of the book of Genesis. And these are five simple truths that I have pulled out and want to highlight for the purpose of this podcast. First, Genesis gives God the ultimate position of power and preeminence over all things. Genesis sets up God as the creator, the master, and the God of the universe. He is eternal. He is perfect. His will is law. And he does whatever he pleases. The second truth that Genesis sets out is that it reveals God in his triune nature. In the first few verses of Genesis, we actually see God, his word, and his spirit all working hand in hand together. That is, we see God the Father, we see the word, which is Jesus Christ, and we see the Holy Spirit. God is so loving to his creation, so eager to reveal himself to mankind, that he does not even let us get 10 verses into his word without showing us how he exists. Even though the Trinity is a deep and sometimes difficult to understand reality about God, God doesn't hold back. God reveals his triune nature in the very beginning. And he reveals it in the very beginning because throughout human history, all three persons of the Godhead are going to play significant roles in the redemption of humanity. And he wants there to be no question of his triune nature in the future, so he reveals it in the very beginning. The next pillar of Genesis that we see in the book is that Genesis is historical dictation from God himself. And because of that, it's accurate. When God calls Moses up into the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, he commands Moses to write down the covenant to Israel, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the book of Moses. It would be referred to as the law throughout the rest of Old Testament history. So God himself gives Moses the words to write. Now we know that scripture is not a dictation. In fact, that is one of the most beautiful parts of Scripture is that God inspired the authors of Scripture to write down the words that he was giving them. But there's a difference between pure dictation and inspiration. And so we see the personalities, the backgrounds, the uniqueness of each author shining through their writing. And that's one of the things that makes Scripture so incredible. And certainly, there is a style that goes with Genesis that comes from its author Moses. But more than that, especially in these first 11 chapters, Moses had nothing but oral tradition to go on. Moses was not an eyewitness of these events. And so we can rest assured that God gives him the details. Much like an eyewitness might give an account to a biographer, God showed Moses, told Moses the events that happened prior to Moses' life, outside of his scope of eyewitness testimony, so that Moses could write down an accurate history of what had happened and what the covenant of God was based on. See, Genesis is absolutely indispensable to the covenant of God with Israel because the covenant of God doesn't start at Mount Sinai when Moses leads the people out of Egypt. The covenant of God starts way back in the very beginning of Genesis when he promises to Adam and Eve that he will send a redeemer. And then he affirms that by making a covenant with Abraham that a couple that is too old to have children will actually have a child. And through that line, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So we can't just start an exodus at Mount Sinai for the covenant. We have to go back to Genesis. We have to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. That is where the covenant begins. And so God gives these words to Moses. 
Because Moses would not have any way to know some of this history in that detail. I'm sure he knew some of it, but he did not know all of it for certain. And so the only way he could have accurately communicated these things is if God had told him what happened. And we know that he had the perfect opportunity to do that because Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain of God with God himself. And in Exodus, it says that Moses spoke with God like a man speaks with his friend. And so we can trust the historicity and the accuracy of Genesis because it was written by a man who sat face to face with God and heard the words from God's own mouth. The next pillar of Genesis is that Genesis deals with the sin question. Genesis answers why there is death and destruction and pain and sorrow in the world. It's because man has rebelled against God. Without the book of Genesis, without the accuracy of its words, man would have no understanding of why death and trouble haunt him all the days of his life. But because of Genesis, we know that man was not made to die. Man was actually made to be eternal. He was made to live forever. That is how God designed man in perfection. In fact, the wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon, penned these incredible words in his book Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, he says this, He, that is God, has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, that is, man's heart, without the possibility that mankind will find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every person who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it and there is nothing to take away from it. And God has so worked that people will fear him. Now, what Solomon is saying there is, look, man has eternity in his heart. It drives man crazy that he dies because man was not originally designed to die. And man will not die now that the designs of God have been set out. And that's his whole point. Man dies. Man can't find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Why? Because man won't be there. Man will die. If Adam and Eve had never sinned, then they would have had knowledge from the beginning to the end. They would live forever and there would be no end. But because man sinned, because man rebelled against God, we die. And so now we cannot find out the works of God from the beginning to the end, apart from what he has revealed to us in his scriptures. And Solomon so incredibly points out that God is working in human history so that man will fear him. Now, If we pair that with Proverbs, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we know from the Proverbs that wisdom leads to life. In other words, the fear of the Lord leads to salvation. That's the point that Solomon is making here. Man dies. Man cannot know the heart of God. The work and the heart of God is far bigger than any man could ever know or even observe But God is constantly working in spite of man's rebellion to bring about salvation. But without Genesis, without the history of its pages, man would not understand the sin problem with which he is plagued. And the final pillar of Genesis that we're going to discuss here is Genesis doesn't just detail out the sin problem of man and leave it there. Genesis also provides the hope of the answer to the sin problem. Within Genesis, within the first three chapters of Genesis, is contained the prophecy of a Redeemer. And throughout the entire book of Genesis, God is detailing this special relationship with Abraham and his line that will lead to the house of Israel, through which the Messiah will ultimately come and save his people. And so without Genesis, we would not have the basis, the foundation of the hope upon which all the prophecies of the Messiah rest. We would not be able to look at Jesus' life and see the fulfillment of the prophecies in Genesis. We would not be able to look at Jesus' life and see the faithfulness of God in providing the Redeemer that he prophesied would come on the very day that Adam and Eve sinned. So it's clear to see that Genesis sets up a foundation for the salvation story that would ultimately encompass the entire scripture. It's easy to see that without Genesis, 
there would be no beginning to reference, no understanding of the heart of God, no understanding of the need of man. In addition to these pillars of Genesis, it is absolutely imperative that when we study Genesis, we approach it from a pure mindset. And that means that we understand a few things before we jump in to Genesis, because there's a lot of noise out there. If you can attack the foundation of a house, you can make the house fall. If you can destroy the foundation of a building, the building will fall. And so Satan has constantly attacked Genesis, because in Genesis is the foundation for all of salvation. In Genesis, the foundation for the entire plan of God. If he can discredit Genesis, he has a legitimate chance at discrediting the entire word of God, but he has never actually been able to do it. Nor, in reality, will he ever be able to discredit Genesis, but that will never stop him from trying. Just as we know from the interactions of demonic beings with Jesus during his ministry, Satan and his demons are fully aware of their end. Yet this knowledge does not cause them to abandon their futile battle against an overwhelmingly powerful enemy who will ultimately destroy them. Instead, in their pride and arrogance, they persist and fight against him. And so we can be sure that just as Genesis has been attacked in the past, it will be attacked in the present and it will be attacked in the future, and the attacks will never end. But we can also be sure that Genesis will never fall, nor will the scriptures. Because Jesus has clearly stated that none of the word of God will pass away. But as believers, it is imperative that we approach the word of God, and especially the study of Genesis, with a mindset that is prepared to read and hear God's word in faith. First, we must remember that because God is the creator, no human mind can refute Genesis. No human was there to witness it. No human is there to naysay it. Only God witnessed it, and God has recorded it in his word for the benefit of man so that we can understand what happened. But in reality, no human can stand and say, this is untrue. I have evidence to prove that this is untrue. To say such a thing would simply be the pinnacle of arrogance. Furthermore, no human study can be used to define God or contradict God because God has created all things and he is not bound by his creation. In fact, the only thing that can bind God is his own word. God can promise and he binds himself to do it because God's word can never be broken. So when God says he will do something, he will do it. But nothing he makes, no entity that he creates can hold him or bind him in any way. The book of Psalms gives perhaps the best single statement about the power and authority of God. When in Psalm 115 verse 3 it says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. In other words, man can never look at God and say, You can't do that. Or I can prove that you can't do that. Or I know that you are bound by something that I believe. I can create a box from which you cannot escape. That is not possible. God is not bound by his creation. He is free to alter his creation. He is free to work within and without his creation. He does not need to obey any law that he has created. He does not need to obey any law of science or physics. He does not need to work within the bounds that bind us as humans. And we know that because God has reached into human history over and over and over again and done the supernatural because he is able to do the supernatural. And so when culture says that science can disprove God, that observation can disprove God, that this discipline can disprove God, that this way of thinking can disprove God, it is all a lie. Because our finite study, using our finite knowledge of a system or a pattern or a law that God has created cannot yield findings which can bind the Almighty, cannot yield evidence of a restriction that applies to God. The only entity that can bind God is himself. The only entity that can hold any sway over God is himself. In fact, we see this very truth in Genesis itself in a dialogue between God and Abraham. When God says in Genesis 22, by myself I have sworn 
declares the Lord. And the rest of the statement's not really that important. You can go read it. It has to do with Abraham being obedient and offering Isaac on the altar. But the point is God's about to make a promise to Abraham. And who does he swear by himself? Because no one else can bind God. Only God can bind God to his own word. That is it. The next part of having a pure mind as we approach the book of Genesis is to understand that God has given overwhelming evidence of his existence and his power throughout human history. And we find much of this evidence in the scriptures, but we also find much of this evidence in the archaeological and written historical record, both within the scriptures and outside the scriptures. The evidence for God, for God's word, for who God is, and for the accuracy of the historicity of scripture is overwhelming. God has raised up many godly men and women who love him and who love his word, who have undertaken to do studies of history, of archaeology, and have come up with thousands and thousands of pieces of evidence that not only support but confirm the historical accuracy of the Bible. In fact, there are even non-believing archaeologists who have gone on record and have admitted that they have never observed an archaeological find that has openly contradicted the scriptures. And again, I'm not going to take the time to lay all this out for you. The evidence is there, and I encourage you to go study it and research it for yourself. Go to those people who love God, who love his word, who God has called to lifelong ministries of seeking the evidence and sharing it with the rest of the world. It's out there and it is overwhelming. You don't have to look hard to find it. But the overwhelming truth is that God has given mankind ample evidence of his power, his existence, and of the accuracy of his word. And the final part of having a pure mindset in approaching this book is that faith is required to understand God's word. There will never be a moment in time when you can point to something and say, this proves everything that God says in his word. Why? Well, because then all you would need would be knowledge. Then all you would need would be an admission that this is accurate. And that is not what gives you a relationship with God. In fact, the scriptures say, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is the driving force of a relationship with God. Without faith, we cannot know God. However, the world's assertion that belief in God is a blind faith in fantasy and fairy tale is just not true. There is overwhelming evidence to support the scriptures, overwhelming evidence to support the words of God. But at the end of the day, salvation is through faith. We know that from the scriptures. And so as we approach this study, if you claim to be a follower of God, you must approach this book with faith, faith that will be supported by rational and logical evidence, but still with faith. You cannot come to this book. You cannot come to the scriptures. You cannot come before God without faith. And we know that faith is the gift of God. And so it means that we must humble ourselves and ask him to give us that faith, to give us what we need to approach his word with a pure heart. Now, with that being said, as we approach the book of Genesis, we are going to do so resting on four specific things. The first is that Jesus affirmed the truth of Genesis in his teaching. Luke 24, 44 through 47 says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And the repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Now let me just explain something to you about the Old Testament. The fact that Jesus says, The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms is extremely important here. The law of Moses traditionally covers the first five books of the Bible. That is what it has always been understood to cover since Moses wrote them. That is what is included when you say the law of Moses. The prophets are exactly what they are. The prophets, the ones who wrote 
messages to Israel proclaiming that God was going to come, proclaiming that a Savior was going to come. These even include some books like historical books, such as Joshua or Samuel or Kings. And the Psalms include a group of books that is the Psalms, but also some of the books that are wisdom books, like Ecclesiastes, for example. So essentially what Jesus is saying is that the entire Old Testament is written about him. It's written about his fulfillment of God's prophecy in Genesis 3 that a Redeemer would come and would undo the curse of sin. Jesus is saying the whole Bible's about me. That's exactly what he's saying in this passage. Don't miss that. Jesus is affirming Genesis in his teaching. He also said in Matthew 5, 17 through 18, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. These iota and dot, these are small punctuation of the Hebrew language. He's saying, look, it's so perfect that even the punctuation will be fulfilled. It's all going to be fulfilled, every word of it. Luke 16, 17 echoes this same concept, but it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Jesus affirmed the scriptures in their entirety, and that includes the book of Genesis in its entirety. The next reality that we're going to approach this book with is that the New Testament authors affirm the truth of Genesis in their writings. In fact, John 1, 1 through 5 may be the strongest testimony in the New Testament to Genesis itself when it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have triune language again here. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, creation. And without him was not anything made that was made. This is affirming the creation statement in Genesis 1, 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Do you see this incredible tie? This incredible tie between the word who created the earth in Genesis. God said, let there be light. The word created the universe. The word hung on the cross. The word rose again, and the word is returning to complete his plan of salvation. 1 John 1, 1 through 3 continues John's thinking in this concept, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. He's talking about Jesus. If you keep going and read verse three, he's talking about Jesus, the son of God which ties in beautifully with what Jesus said in Luke 24, 44 through 47, that everything written in the Old Testament about him was to come true, that he was supposed to die and rise again, and that his salvation was to be proclaimed throughout the nation. See, it all ties together. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 goes even further with this. It says, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. We got triune language again appearing here in Hebrews. And he upholds the universe by his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Again, in Hebrews 11.3, we have, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And we could go on and on and on. And I even wrote down more scriptures that I'm probably not going to actually get to here in this podcast episode. But you can see it. It's tied back to the beginning. Jesus was there with God. The Spirit was there with God. Why? Because God exists in triune form. Because Genesis is breathed from his mouth. Because all of scripture is accurate. 
and demands that those who follow Jesus believe in the accuracy and the historicity of Genesis. We don't get to question it. Those of us who have said, yes, Lord, I believe that Jesus died and rose and I have put my hope in him for salvation, we are bound to accept all of his words. Why? Because the word is Jesus Christ. The next piece of this is that Jesus affirmed Mosaic authorship. In other words, Jesus affirmed that Moses wrote Genesis. This is a maligned point. There are so many quote-unquote biblical scholars, and I say quote-unquote because, again, you can be a scholar without faith. You can be a scholar in something and not believe in it. But so many men and women who have studied the Word and have long sets of letters behind their names from all the different university degrees that they hold have come out and suddenly claimed to be enlightened and have proclaimed that Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible, despite Jesus affirming this with his own words. In Mark 12, 26 and 27, Jesus is answering a skeptic. He's answering a Sadducee who's asking him a question about being raised from the dead. Now, what's entertaining about that is the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. And Jesus, in his very direct way, points this out. But he says this, he says, And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses? In the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Now, I'm sure that someone who hears that will say, oh, but that passage is talking about Exodus. Yes, you're right. It's talking about Exodus 3. But the reality is that the law is never separated out. The law is always referred to as the whole law, the very beginning of the Bible. This is how the Jewish nation has kept the law of Moses. It is the first five books of the Bible. They've kept it that way for thousands and thousands of years. When Jesus is speaking to this man, this this person who would have studied the law, and he talks about the book of Moses, he's not talking about Exodus. He's talking about the Pentateuch. He's talking about the whole work. It was not all neatly formatted the way it is today. It was a book written by Moses, that detailed the law, the history of Israel, the history of the covenant with Israel, which doesn't start in Exodus with Moses at Mount Sinai, like I said before. It starts with Abraham in Genesis. And how do we know this? Well, we know this from another passage. In Luke 24, verse 25 through 27, Jesus is walking on the Emmaus road with several of his disciples. And he is listening to them lament the death of Jesus. They don't recognize him. He veils their eyes so that they can't recognize him. And he is listening to them just struggle with doubt. And he says these words to them. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now again, don't forget, Moses is also a prophet. So he's included in the prophets as well. O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, all the scriptures. And what does he begin with? Moses. Do you honestly think that Jesus started in Exodus? Of course not. He started in Genesis. He probably started in Genesis 3 with the promise of God to Adam and Eve that he would send a redeemer who would crush the serpent's head. And the final fact point that we're going to rest on here as we embark on this study in Genesis is that the authorship of Moses for the first five books of the Bible is uniquely supported by the fact that Moses had unique access to God that individually qualified him to write Genesis. Now, to understand this, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination to journey back to Mount Sinai when Moses leads the children of Israel there. Put yourself at that place. Try to envision it. They're at Mount Sinai. God 
descends on the mountain. The mountain is covered in fire and smoke. The ground is shaking. The people are terrified. And God calls Moses up into the mountain. I don't know about you, but this this sounds absolutely terrifying to me. But Moses is a man of unbelievable faith. And in Exodus 24, 15 through 18, Moses obeys God. And it says, then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The cloud, this is not a regular cloud. This is the Shekinah glory of God. This is the overwhelmingly bright cloud of God's power. This is the cloud that the children of Israel are following through the wilderness. This is not some naturalistic occurrence. This is God's glory. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, if we fast forward to Exodus 33, it says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside of the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out of the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone in the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Then again in verse 34. One of these instances, Moses is back up on the mountain after the children of Israel have sinned, after Moses has broken the tablets of the law, Moses goes back up on the mountain. Then the Lord told Moses, write down these words because I'm making a covenant with you and with Israel according to these words. Now the covenant doesn't start here. The covenant started back at Abraham. Write down these words because I'm making a covenant And it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's not just the law. It's all of it. How do we know? While Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights, he did not eat or drink. He wrote the Ten Commandments, the words of the covenant on tablets. Now, there's a little thing you have to understand here. From Exodus 31, we understand who the he in this sentence is. It's not Moses, because Exodus 31 explains to us that God wrote the actual laws on the stone tablets with his finger. So what is Moses writing? When God says, write down these words because I'm making a covenant with you and with Israel, according to these words, what is Moses writing? God's writing the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone with his finger. What is Moses writing? The Pentateuch. He's writing the first five books of the Bible. That's the whole point. God is giving him divine revelation while he's talking to him in the cloud of Shekinah glory, face to face like a man talks with his friend. And Moses is being instructed how to write the very foundation of scripture by God in the presence of his glory. How do we know he was in the presence of God himself? When Moses came down from the mountain, this is verse 29 of the same chapter, Exodus 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he had the two tablets in his hand and he did not know that the skin of his face was ablaze with light because he had been speaking with God. This is the attitude, this is the approach that we are going to take as we walk through the book of Genesis over the coming weeks and months, we're going to humble ourselves and look at the foundation of our salvation. We're going to look at the words of God given to Moses, inscribed through his pen, that have built the entire foundation of 
for the plan of God, the entire revelation of the heart of God towards humanity. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. Jesus accomplished what no one else could do. If the law and the prophets don't exist, then we could not possibly understand the depth of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I hope this lengthy but very important opening to the book of Genesis fills you with anticipation to look into the pages of Scripture and to see the majesty of what God has accomplished, to see the beauty of his plan, and to approach that with a humble heart, with faith, willing to accept from God's hand all of his word, and to obey it, and to love him for his sacrifice, and for making a way for you to have fellowship with him. Because the book of Genesis is going to show you why you should not have fellowship with God. The book of Genesis is going to reveal to you why all mankind should be stricken down in the presence of God. But God is so loving. God is so incredibly generous and gracious and merciful. And the book of Genesis sets out this unbelievable backdrop for God's love, for God's mercy, for God's goodness and God's grace. And it frames the death of Jesus Christ in this incredible frame of glorious beauty. And as you ask God to open your eyes to see this, you will be filled with a new sense of awe and a new sense of worship. And I hope this will cause you to get on your knees and just praise him for who he is and what he has done. I hope you're as excited as I am to dig into this book, and I can't wait to get started. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Drippings from the Honeycomb. If you would like to learn more about Another 12 Ministries and the work that we are doing to train ministry leaders to bring the gospel to all people, visit another12.org. If you would like to support our ministry, click on the donate link in the description below.